Hey there, thanks for tapping over. You know, I frequently get thrown back to a moment in college. To a particular auditorium that was far oversized for the 40-person political theory class that I was there twice a week for. Sitting in a back corner of the auditorium, I listened to the young hipster professor talk about Rousseau and his first discourse. Summarizing this dense, centuries-old text in his own succinct way that was incredibly captivating, the professor explained that our ethics as human beings are always in an arms race against our technology. That technology will continually outpace our ethical ability to contend with it, to contend with the changes it brings. In our contemporary world of a post-atomic bomb, our mind frequently goes to military advancements and their technological detriment to us. This, though, really is the case for all technology, from the plow to the cotton gin, not just military tech, or relating to war even minutely. Though somehow war does sometimes end up cropping up. Like being able to grow more food, can make somebody a rich target for a strong or desperate foe. Just look at Egypt over the millennia. It was frequently conquered for just the geography it inhabits, and the ability for that geography to grow massive amounts of wheat. The printing press brought mass literacy, but also the introduction to tabloids and periodicals about spotting witches and what to do with them let alone a complete flip on authority, for good or for ill. Now, I don't want to imply by any means that our past technologies like the printing press were bad, or that what was brought through their introduction was bad. Technology doesn't know bad. It's a tool. What is done with the tool is where ethics come in, and ethics is what defines what's bad. What I do want to imply is that there is trouble with their introduction, and we should recognize that. When a new technology is introduced, it changes us, and our reaction to that often has unintended consequences. Along with recognizing in our current time that the abilities our technology is providing more and more are further outpacing our set of ethics to incorporate that and advance as a species. Our current age of complexity is littered with this very problem. Just think about this dance between ethics and technology as a matter of first principles. Learning and adapting a new technology is like magic with the capabilities it provides at Go. Typically, it requires an understanding of some higher order of knowledge, nuclear tech being a great advanced example needing to know how electrons and reactions are going to create a chain that perpetuates itself into a mass explosion, of which we can then harness for energy. But even a stirrup for a horse saddle requires a knowledge of metals, heat, geometry, all in a high order that requires knowledge not easily come by. Knowing how to apply any tech will always come before knowing the proper way of doing it all all the applications that can be done, all the ways it will build within this complex reality it exists in. It simply can't get figured out before its induction. Social media wasn't seen as a way to spread mind viruses or a stir up a way to wage better, more efficient war, but they both happened. Rolling on a bed, lighting a cigarette was a regular occurrence in movies seen without consequence or really thought that that was happening. Today, doing the same motion of rolling on a bed, but instead going into our phones with a thumb scroll, could one day be thought of it in the same way. Such is the path of human progress. We make something that's a great tool, and it evolves, or vice versa, we wait a generation to rectify or fully understand the effects which is why it's vital to recognize whenever a new capability comes into the society, not think only what it can solve for, but what will it affect, what it will challenge in us, and by what nature it will challenge our ethics. 
For this episode, we have a discussion on Web3, what this technology can bring and do for us. Ultimately, and quickly, becomes a cascade into discussing the advancing world we seem only to be speeding faster and faster into. With adding the blockchain to the web, we get all of our present experiences online, while adding a new ownership layer and ability to automate transactions. The fundamentals of what that means, complexities, and then how we can actually see what that translates to and why it's such a big deal, we dive into in the discussion. What I think is important to ponder with this is how it's a great example staring us right in the face right now for the age-old conundrum of human technology outpacing our ethics again. Will Web3 codify no privacy online with automatic fines for poor behavior or an inability to make purchases or enter certain areas? By way, it would bring us not a utopia, but a more complete version of 1984. On the flip side, will it bring us a way to modulize and incentivize the better angels of our nature to empathize deeper with one another? So we all have an easier path to healing and reaching our individual path to enlightenment and just becoming a better fucking person. Web3's biggest splash so far that made it popular in the zeitgeist involved photos fetching outrageous sums and celebrities making money off of crypto. But the aspects of the technology that will have the most staying power are still unknown, at least how it will have that staying power expressed. How any tech is applied is always difficult to predict. Anyone who tells you how it's going to doesn't actually know. Areas ripe for this tech, for blockchain's application, we dive into in the discussion. Not long into doing so, we begin begging the question of, should this be done? To what extent should it be done? Who decides what's done? What about nuance? What about authority? Justice? In other words, it's hard to talk about Web3 without quickly getting brought into some deep ethical questions. Something I contend is actually the case for all tech when it comes into the fold. What's so unique about our time is the pace and the ability for what we develop to have such deep, profound effects on our society. Look at what social media is doing for good and ill. Exposing corruption while dismantling all authority. Connecting us around the world while breaking apart neighborhoods. Simultaneously, addicting us through a dopamine on a slow drip to escape our physical reality. We've already become cyborgs in a matrix all but the hard interface plug in the back of our head. Just through our thumbs on a black rectangle. Our reality, though is what's inside of our heads. See, we don't need that tube feeding us a photorealistic hologram in the back of our brain. We make all that escape world already with every tap on a screen projecting a different image through an LCD. Our ethics of behavior didn't even catch up to the nuclear standoff, let alone the internet, or now how something seemingly banal as just knowing who owns what data. But as more of a society is built on this digital plane, or attached to it, more of our reality can be affected by altering or changing what exists or is owned digitally. This doesn't even touch other tech advancements that really concern me, like genetics, altering what it means to eat meat, be a human, what we bring back from the dead, selecting our children, how we have children, so on and so forth. Where we land and what I think about frequently is desiring an improved set of ethics, matching or at the very least advancing the world we inhabit. With advancing tech tempting us into ever more complex situations we'll have to face. I don't even need to give examples to deposit ideas or images and how wild our technology is becoming or already is. Ever greater at what it does, but ever worse at helping us understand why we breathe. Where are we in this reality? 
what is consciousness? So I suppose we end this episode where all text seems to lead us. Progress. That hyperbolic word, cliche as ever, but we usually associate it with futuristic cities, electricity, and coming out of a previous primitive or brutal before. When the real driver of what progress is, is a philosophy to view and act within reality. And with that, my discussion on Web3 with Josh, founder of State365, an amazing Web3 startup that's disrupting the world of short-term rentals a la Airbnb, as well as much more. I really encourage you to check them out or join their Discord. As well as Dr. Yusuf Smith, an MD and personal trainer that helps other personal trainers get traction online. He's also really great, really smart, knows a lot of health things, anything you want when it comes to fitness, health. His website, Propane Fitness, that he does with his business partner, Johnny, is impeccable. Both of these folks have been on previous episodes, and I encourage you to check those out as well. In this discussion, we talk about what is Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3, how we should not repeat the sins of previous waves of the web with this one, complexity versus technology, and how nature always fights back, how centralized systems are more fragile but more efficient versus decentralized systems, which are, le- which are linear in scale and growth but modular and more nimble. What would health insurance look like if it was on-chain? How would we be able to incentivize health behaviors? We also talk about token-based voting, DAOs, electoral systems, and hacking them, all while facing the reality that beckons in which we still need better people to vote for. The difficulties of putting everything on-chain, before ending with the discussion on ethics and real-world concerns, how Web3 is a Trojan horse in more ways than one, And lastly, giving some tips on how to live more decentralized. Thank you very much for listening. Wherever this finds you on our beautiful blue marble, I'm wishing you well. Hey, real quick while I have you here. If you like what you're listening to, please tap that follow or subscribe, as well as sign up for notifications so you'll know when our next season or episode drops. Also, if you're curious to look at our catalog of all that we have to offer and some exciting things we have to come, please visit us at bandwidth.productions. All right. Thank you all for joining. Um, Both of you were on before. I'll take care of the introductions in the beginning. Um, but to get started, I do want to ask a question just so we can get all at our humanity, if you will. Uh, and I want to ask both of you, um, what's something you've learned that has made you happy recently? Whoever wants to go first with that one. Great question. Yeah, that was, I did not expect that. You can think I can always fill the air. That's gonna, I'm, I need to actually think now. I didn't think I was going to have to engage my brain so, so soon in here. Yeah, that's totally fine. It's part of the, it's part of the game. So this sounds really stupid, but you, when you read a book a year apart or two years apart, you're a different person reading the book and the book feels like a different set of lessons. And that has made me very happy because there's so much wisdom in some of the, you know, the absolute bangers that you read and you think, oh man, how am I going to find another one like that? Read it five years later and it's like a whole new book. So it's, that's shifted my perspective along the explore versus exploit spectrum to saying, maybe we don't necessarily always need to be looking for the next thing and the, the cutting edge of new lessons and science and whatever. And actually some of the stuff we've already got under our belt is hidden gems. We're sat on a treasure already. Is there something in particular that made you think of that? Somebody tweeted at me with a quote about it's not probably like a Zen saying like when the man sits by the river, he is a different man and the river is a different river. So I, I totally butchered that. Do you, do you know the one I'm talking about? Yeah. When a man puts his foot in the river, he is never the same man, nor is the river. Much more elegantly put. Yeah. 
It wasn't me, but that's what it is. <laughs> That's uh, that's great. No, I've I've read a lot of books and then gone back and um, looked at the footnotes. Like, I if I'm reading a physical copy, I like annotating it, and if I'm reading an audio book, I like audio book. I like doing the same thing with the little markers. Um, now I've actually bought the physical book with the audio book to make the markers in physical. Uh, nice. But and gone back and flipped through it, and just to your point, like you get so much more out of it. Like, there's a book actually that I just took off my shelf in my office by john dewey is like an american philosopher um largely considered like the american philosopher but he has this book called uh human nature and conduct and i read it in college and then i read it again six months ago and i was like holy fuck this guy set my entire life group blueprint out and i had no idea like he talks about like habit and how habit is necessary for creativity but destroys your creativity and how habit is the both the means of virtue and vice and like all these things that are like core thoughts of mine and I was like, this is where it came from? Holy shit. <laughs> That's very cool. It's when you stumble on it and you're like, what if I hadn't come across this? Do you do you use anything like Obsidian or um, any second brain type app? No, other than the one that I'm building, no. Oh. I've tried the one that you sent me and it was really good. It was great research. But nice. right now, no, it's all in, in a database with disparate means of me ex- like extracting it, uh, but not yet. I suppose if if you if you're able to build software, then that's like such an advantage. You can then build it exactly how you want it. Just I was going to suggest there's a. In fact, I'm wearing the t-shirt. This isn't even sponsored, but um, this is uh, you know Readwise, the company that they do like highlights that email you. They randomize. You sent me. This is the company you sent me. Yeah. Ah, uh, cool. Yeah. So um, just I've just found it as a way to like when, whenever I'm reading PDF or an EPUB or something highlighting it and then it automatically syncs into a archivable second brain yeah that's great um what about you jw was that enough time to get your brain working at 4 p.m in the afternoon yeah it, 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 it was it was what you said um yusuf that actually sparked something i remember that I, I can't i can't remember how recent i learned this but i think it's recent enough to count for this it's the fact that um and i came across this on in, on instagram i did then verify on google so i can say this is a real fact um that the human body <clears throat> refreshes itself every seven years <clears throat> sorry yeah the human body refreshes itself every seven years so in seven years time you are an entirely different person than the you that you were seven years ago and to me that's just astounding like it shows the power of healing in the human body and when you apply that same theory to the brain like you are actually dealing with an entire not not just a new brain but every cell in your brain is entirely different from the one seven years ago so to add on to your point it's sort of that additional context that we gain over time is actually not being thought with, you know, our old brain. It's actually being thought with an entirely new brain. Um, and I don't know why that makes me slightly happy, but it does. I think it gives me a sense of hope and optimism for the future that's kind of instilled in that message. I think the original came from the ship that's sailing across the ocean and it's gradually repaired more and more until every plank of wood is different from the one on the ship that departed originally. I think that's just a, such a powerful concept to hold in mind. Yeah, that is awesome. Yeah, no, that I like that a lot. Uh, that's a, a really great term for really all things in biology, not just like our own life as we go mm-hmm. along, but systems change. Like I think about systems a lot and a system itself, like a government or an organization or really anything, a ship even, a ship really is a system because if it doesn't have people constantly keeping it up, it's going to be covered in barnacles at the bottom of the ocean. Um, so it's just really true. Yeah. Like you have to keep refreshing and adding more energy to it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's almost like there, there is a physicality in the structure and these metaphorical structures, these structures we place like governments, like an organization, there is more to that structure than perhaps we think there is a physicality to it because if it can withstand while every component changes, then there's something of a permanence in that structure or in that system. Yeah. Which is really just the momentum of the, the people or the, you know, organisms within it. Um, the old, uh, when you've got the broomstick and you replace the handle and the broom 10 times each and but somehow there's some continuity of but that broom is still your broom yeah that the human context applied to it i think <laughs> yeah is it like a pathetic fallacy where you uh give uh human qualities to animals or inanimate things 
Um, JW, could you move your mic a little, just a tad bit closer? Um, but while we're doing that, okay, I'm going to shift gears and I'm going to give a definition of what I think Web3 is. And then if anyone wants to comment on that, mm-hmm. and then we can kind of go from there and fractal out into all kinds of funsies. Um, so what I would say... <laughs> Great use of funsies. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than party drugs or something like that. Um, okay, so uh, what I would say Web3 is... so. I mean, first, I think you have to define what one and two are. So web one is open protocols on the internet. So information systems exchanging, which often took the form of just websites. So think of like the yellow pages or just being able to have a flat file, like a website, just any old informational website. Then web two starts coming along. And that's the ability of being able to have closed systems through an open protocol. So you can have login essentially. And now you can curate ex- experiences behind a gate essentially right and that's that i would that's how i would broadly define web 2 how i would define web 3 is web 1 plus web 2 plus a blockchain which is a public database that allows anybody through same open protocols so in other words everyone can understand how to exchange the data and whatever it is being exchanged right but in a way that is still secure even though the fact that everybody can write to this blockchain and from being able to do that, you're able to do all kinds of fun things. Um, you're able to, say, say, point two different groups of people together and allow them to exchange data and have that be taken care of because they've already agreed to a contract. So an exchange of information or exchange of something on this public database, right? And that's what really Web3 is. Web3 is Web1, Web2, plus an open blockchain to be able to go back and forth on it. Now... What is, a, what is done on that blockchain starts to get into the hairiness pretty quickly because you can have crypto and crypto is, you know, a, a branch of doing this Web3 stuff, which is, you know, you can have financial assets, you can have decentralized finance, which automates your finance if it's in crypto and things like that. And it starts getting into the variations rather quickly. But that's how I would broadly define Web3. Um, See, I'd say you gave a very good, te- your definition was up here. Like it was for a uni student level, kind of it has some level of understanding already. I want to simplify it just Perfect. a little bit here. Um, so I would say, remember, guys, I'm I'm nine years old. So if you can explain to me at nine year old level, please. I can oh, do it at okay. five year old level. Or do you want better? Right, let's go for it. <laughs> okay, so web one is read, read only, static files, static websites. You can read things. That's it. Read only. Um, that was when it first came around to just basically share information between universities. They figured, hey, other people might like to view this information. Maybe I can add my brochure or a blog or something like that. So Web1, static, read only. Web2 came along and it's read and also publish. So it's read and write. So you can actually publish things back onto the web. You can interact with websites. This was what led to apps like Uber um, with increased internet connectivity, having 4G, you can now have much more powerful interactive systems in your pocket. And it was mobile that really drove this forward. Airbnb, Uber, Amazon, social media being a big one. Publishing content became a thing. People made careers out of it. And the social network um, that was really, I think, the killer use case for the internet, and which w- what drove Web2 forward to be the best it could be. So Web1, read. Web2, read plus write. Web3 is read, write, and you own it too. So it's introducing that concept of trackable, verifiable ownership via the blockchain. That was the big revolution that came along. You know, Bitcoin kind of invented it way back over 10 years ago now. And since then, Ethereum has come along. And Ethereum, that's the killer use case for Web3. Being able to say, okay, here's this digital thing that's actually, you can prove it, you can track a wallet key, and you can say that person right there on the internet who's connected with his wallet to this blockchain is the owner of this thing. And then that enables things like DeFi, NFTs. Um, You know, when you apply the same concept to social media and having ownership over your followers, being able to export them between platforms, it's just a new interface and an open architecture for a better internet to be built on top of. So that's maybe a bit more understandable. Yeah. So the first thing that comes to mind to me for that is the step from Web 1 to Web 2 is Mm. not just a shift in direction and suddenly like it goes from 100% read to 50 read, 50% write. It's not that at all. Like, as you say, the social networking suddenly means that I imagine it completely dwarfs the amount that any website publisher can create 
from a single node, suddenly you've mm-hmm. got billions of people desperately posting as much data and video and putting so many hours into writing stuff. And then you've got these companies like Instagram that are rapidly trying to build more and more server houses and data centers so that they can just keep up with the amount that's being written. So I think it's important Mm -hmm. to highlight like going from web one to web two is not just like, oh, now we can write as well as read. It's boom, like absolute dwarfing of like now the crowd is throwing data at the data centers and being hosted elsewhere. But I guess along with that comes the implication of ownership, as you say. And I'd, I'd love to to hear about how yeah. the the ownership it's, and it's, security it's, implications are going to affect this. It, yeah, it's kind of a non-linear network acceleration. And, you know, going with your example, how many data points you're having to, how many floating point operations each network system is having to calculate for a given website with Web2 functionality, with people publishing. Take Twitter as an example, right? Recent news. You've got on Twitter something, I, I can't remember how many in the order of hundreds of billions of different messages and tweets are being sent per day on Twitter, but they have to carry more bandwidth than a lot of websites do for that. Now imagine if every single interaction was measured and owned and had to go through an order of magnitude higher processes to get to a finalized result on a distributed blockchain. So it is, yes, it's it's nonlinear acceleration. And then you go to Web4 and you say, well, now AI is going to be involved in kind of fulfilling a lot of the tasks on the human end. And the number of actors will increase an order of magnitude again. Um, So I think we are seeing this sort of logarithmic step up with every system that's introduced. Yeah, and, and a bit of a phase shift to like introduce the physics of it, right? So like networking effects, every time that something changes, the rapid acceleration in the beginning of it is exponential, and then it starts to level off, right? Or at least start to gain something that's more of a linear type of growth pattern, right? Like Web 2 explosion because everyone's reading and writing, and other explosion because everyone's tracking everything, right? So the example I always give is like, I put into my phone and I get Google Maps, and so now I can tell Google Maps where I want to go. And now I'm going there. I think the only data exchange in there is it telling me the directions, but it's also monitoring my speed, traffic conditions, what it's supposed to be based off of all that. And it's creating all these metadata layers. Um, The same is true for really anything on the internet, tracking your processes and things like that. So the explosion of data went up and now we're kind of entering a bit of a phase shift with Web3 of introducing some bits of this have to get written back to this other database in which we're going to pay the, the costs of that, which is, I think, some of the shaking out of the use case of how is who's going to pay for that and what's actually going to be the means of that making sense and sustainable what what's going to be the limiting factor like what what are we talking into because it sounds expensive like when you're saying that every bit that is transmitted is going to have to be verified and sent through multiple nodes and is is the limiting factor going to be data like storage or electricity or time like what's the bottleneck um, well, if you look at systems like Solana or Polygon, you know, they're able to process like something like a million transactions a second um, rather cheaply. And I think, you know, I, I use Solana quite a bit. I've kind of explored that. And per transaction, say, if you want to, I don't know, very early use cases, buying an NFT, um, it will cost you maybe 20 pence, um, you know, 30 pence, the absolute maximum. You look at other solutions that come along that can basically reduce that down to three two or three P when it gets below a penny or below a cent, that's when you've got a viable system that can be used at scale, but we're not there yet. Um, Blockchain is working in the background. Few understand that it is actually a foundation way more than people give it credit for right now. When that realization is met and money will be poured into developing these, you know, we need, we're not there yet in terms of deep tech, in terms of hardware, we need to have next generation computation systems to just be able to handle the bandwidth that something like that would demand but we're making progress in the right direction. Well, the other thing to that is, I would say there's two folds that, to that making it more costly. There's the software and the hardware, right? The software, we've had like a great revolution with the concept of proof of stake. So that makes things a little bit faster than mm-hmm. rather having to have like all these different computers trying to solve a cryptographic puzzle and the one that gets it first gets it, mm-hmm. you know, like that's like a rather great use case for some things. I think it actually is a great use case for money. Um, but as far as like using this as a database, it doesn't make much sense. So having proof of stake or things like the Lightning Network, which is proof of stake plus not having to have an entire node system, but being able to chain kind of directions and nodes together to make something. And then the other side of it is the hardware, like, you know, like 
all of our machine learning systems are based off of one one use case that was able to pay for all of the tech, which is marketing, right? Like all of our computation right now is based off of one industry and that's gaming. Like most of our systems are using graphics cards, which is all, we're all built to be rendering game, you know, game images. And then we were, someone figured out like, oh, wow, I can do tensor, you know, applications on this and I can be running, you know, computations so much faster by using a graphics card. I think we need another tool, which Jack Dorsey actually has, has talked rather flippantly about, of we need another piece of hardware that is purpose built for this type of computation. And that will help bring the, the cost down again. I, I still think, though, that regardless of that, and let's say we have perfect world, we have like proof of stake 2.0, whatever that is. We have some great purpose built chip or something that is, is, is computing this for us. Um, I still think we're going to have to pick and choose what data we put to the blockchain. I don't think it's going to be in the same realm of what we have right now going to it. Um, and even still, I think it's going to be a chain of chains. Like, I don't think it's going to be one chain that has everything. I think you may have one chain that's mm. like far more secure and maybe that's like your user profile data. And then you have another chain that you're okay with it having your like, you know, browsing history on it. And then you have another chain that, you know what I mean? That is just, that's just the access to file storage or something like that. Right. Um, I think it's going to be a much more mesh network, but I think the linchpin to JW's point is you're able to control that flow of data between these different chains. Um, which may also mean you have to pay for it, right? Like one of the big things that we did unwittingly with Web 2 that I hope we don't replicate with Web 3 is saying, oh, we get all this free shit. Awesome. Totally. Mm. Let's do it. <laughs> Not realizing that the that, free shit we're yeah. giving is all of our intimate mm -hmm. personal details. That part I'm worried about because I think nobody's learned the lessons, even through the kind of the, the, the bounce back and people starting to realize like, oh, actually, um, these guys are data mining us and you know, we're, we're, we are the product and we're getting squeezed for, for all this and we're providing much more value to them than they are to us. And the mental health impacts and the suicide rate and the body image, you know, all, all these things. But people don't seem to have learned their lesson. And I, I am worried that it just takes someone to come along and be like, rather than paying $2 a month, you could get this for free. Hmm. And you're like, you'll have loads of people just be like, oh, yep, yeah, fine. And then market forces will just slam it in that direction <laughs> so i don't know how that can be communicated by saying look when you when it's free you are paying through non-financial means mm, the problem with that is i genuinely do not think anybody cares that's the problem like, isn't it especially not yet see that's the thing so ai algorithms they they kind of they're kind of shitty i'm not gonna lie to you like if I'm scrolling through, I, I, I leave my all my cookies, like I give Facebook all of my data. I'm happy. I, I like to see the results that they give me as a kind of mini experiment. So I'm like, right, this is the data I know they have. What are they actually going to recommend me? It's terrible. I haven't bought anything from a Facebook advert. And I look at them often just to see. I haven't found anything that's really relevant to me in a long time. I think it's gone down recently because they've kind of lost some of those generalizing umbrella algorithms recently with Apple's thing. Hmm. I give them all my data. I'm happy to. And the algorithms aren't yet at a stage where it's like they know dangerously a lot about you. I think that will come soon. And when you have like a VR headset on, they can track how long you look at a particular point of the screen for and how your heartbeat increases when you're looking at something. And, you know, when they get access to biometric data, I think the game changes. But until we get to that point, I think we're safe for now. And even at that, at that point, I think people are being conditioned to basically just don't, not mind people having this data. So I think, yeah, I don't like how that's going to trend down. Yeah, that's, trend that's down. a very ominous thing. We're like, well, they can't quite read our thoughts yet, but it's coming. Yeah, very Orwellian, I know. Yeah. But <laughs> you can't change human nature as far as I'm aware. So yeah, I, I think we need to work out ways to minimize its impact on us to you know to focus on safe and ethical data storage and usage rather than just eliminating it altogether well yeah i mean tristan harris is the ex ex google um employee talks about this of saying that everything's been optimized mm. for the particular kpi of time on screen as the the, mm. the best proxy for what gives you the most fertile ground to serve you ads but if that kpi was switched for something like time well spent or something which was a user selected metric like you know i minutes meditated or tracked my calories or something that's like using an app for its intended purpose that makes someone come away from their phone being like yeah actually i was 
pleased with how I used that, um, then we'd have a very different, like phones would be a very different thing and they'd be used for our personal growth. But as you say, because there's a bit of resistance to it, it's not as kind of, it's not blasting out your dopamine receptors. It's never going to happen. I have a use case where it did though. Oh. So like in my lifetime, it went from mm. being able to smoke in a Denny's, which is like a, like a chain <laughs> diner, right? Where people would ask mm. you when you first walk in the door, like, oh, how many are in your party? Okay, party five, smoking or non-smoking? But it didn't fucking matter because the whole restaurant smelled like smoke. You know what I mean? <laughs> and no one ever talked about quitting smoking, right? Never, never was a thing. Mm. And now you hear somebody that's starting, you know, at the age of 15 to start smoking, be like, what are you doing with your life? Right? Like that changed and something mm. changed that. And we can go into like the nuances of what changed that. But I think the ball is starting to roll in which social media and just the algorithms that drive are like Tristan Harris talks about like going down the brainstem, right? Like all these algorithms are trying to go down our brainstem. And actually JW, I actually think that the social media algorithms are far more powerful than you're giving credit for. I think you're a terrible use case for them because you're on the internet too much across too many disparate things. You're just opting into things for fun. Like, <laughs> oh, there's also that too. But you're Which is what my business partner does because, you know, we're, we're marketers. And so he just he just mm. opts into everything because he's like, oh, I want to see what their funnel's like. And so you're just like mm. telling everyone that like, oh, I'm a buyer. Right. But to my point <laughs> about uh, John Dewey and Habit, if someone that was more habitual was on the internet, you'd be able to spot their patterns far faster and be able to serve them content that is far better than anything else, right? Like I always laugh and I joke with my wife because uh, my YouTube algorithm clearly thinks I'm African-American and will give me like clear, like African-American products like just spam me, right? But because it's the only thing I could go on there is like I'm watching, you know, rap videos and, you know, mixtapes of NBA stars. Like, so it's just sh- serving like content. Kind of products and like- yeah, it, no, it's literally, I get that, <laughs> literally, or bump, yeah, like bump control and things like that. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's, there needs to be some type of movement, which I think is slow and it's hard to see right now in which people are starting to see social media in the same way that we see smoking, which is the same thing in my mind, you know, it's, as far as like what it's doing, as far as forming your brain, it's, it's creating a habitual addiction. I think it's actually far worse because it's far more on our foundations of what we are as humans, which is, you know, social beings and outrage. You know, like I, I think, you know, I was, I was having this thought experiment last night, actually. Like I live in a small town. I heard sirens. And in the two years I've lived in this small town, I went from hearing sirens as a regular occurrence to when I hear them, I'm like, oh shit, what's happening? And like, you know, a couple months ago I heard sirens and my neighbor's house was on fire. And I was like, oh my God. And it was tragic to me. Right. But if I was in a city and the same proximity to me, there were sirens and a fire, I would walk past almost like a bystander and I would be like mm-hmm. gawking. It's background right? noise. Exactly. And I would have the same sense of like wanting to gawk at it, but it would be like out of like shock, but I would have no emotional connection to them. So it wouldn't be like a sense of sadness. It it would be replaced by like, you know, gaper, like the thing they always talk about in, you know, the States when there's an accident on the highway, they call it like gapers delays. Everyone's slowing down to watch the accident. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's just our social hangover of used to being to know people in town where we still see something as tragic. We, We have the empathy immediately, but we no longer have the connection. So just kind of to tie it all together, I think we need to start looking at these algorithmic world we're, work, we're living in and this data that we're giving as something that's trying to constantly attack us. And once we get to that point, I think we can have the uh, more perfect data nuance and you know it'll be better. But I think for some part of the population, it's going to segment and it's going to end up being the dystopia that JW was, was talking about. I remember you saying that on the last episode, John that that pro- your prediction is that not that we're all going to move towards the lowest common denominator or that there's going to be this mass enlightenment but there's actually just going to be a bifurcation of humans and one of them is going to be totally the product of all that stuff and the other one is is going to be reacting to it and trying to go off grid as much as possible yeah i think so that's almost that reminds me of uh, the the teachings or what ray kurzweil says with you know the the predicted singularity when uh, the systems are improving at a rate too fast for us to really comprehend or understand. Mm-hmm. And it will be those two forks, as you said, one fork who is, you know, got the chip in their head and they're connected <laughs> with the system and they're able to sort of understand it. It's it's funny to think about, but 
it is 100% going to happen within all of our lifetimes and, you know, relatively early too, I think. So. And it, th- there will probably be uh, some form of revolution at that point where the people kind of do want to drop off grid. So how, how many people do you know who are like, oh, you know what, I really want to get like a Nokia 3310, like the old school thing, but I've got a smartphone because it's just so convenient because I can pay with my face and I can order an Uber. These are people who are actively resisting it, but because of the allure of the convenience, they've been sucked back in. And I think that's going to be it, as you say, like the the chip in the brain is going to make your life so much more smooth Mm. that you go, do you Mm. know what? I can't be asked to try and fight this every day. Yeah, it's it's going to take us to a point where things are so seamless that you're going to be at such a massive disadvantage in work to not have one. And that, I think, is going to be a principal issue because it's like if you're going into a job, you know, there's and you can view this through multiple different lenses, either working on your own business or if you're a FANG employee or just, you know, middle, and you have any remote ambition and you don't have this chip and everybody around you does. You are not getting promoted. You're not even going to make it to next year before you're so outcompeted on every level. Um, yes, I think that is what's going to make people want to do it because you're going to have to, like, it's going to be, it's Mm going to be a choice. It's going to be free will. Obviously they're not going to force everybody to do it, but it's going to be such a crunch to not have one that I think everybody's just going to voluntarily do it. If we can do it. I'm very bullish on that. Mm -hmm. If that being even a possibility, because the second that you, okay. I mean, there's so many layers of this, like if you can actually create an interface that can go from electrons into the chemical reactions that are our brain, if we can actually nail that to a degree, which I think we can nail mm. to a degree that it's useful, but if we can nail it to a degree that's simpatico and you're like completely seamlessly integrated, mm. at what point do you cease becoming yourself and how would your biological systems react to that? Like biological systems atrophy rather quickly when they're not having the stimuli that they're used to. So would that create atrophy and then you end up becoming just more of like a zombie to this well, computer chip machine going There's, back and also mm-hmm. the first three generations of that are probably going to make a lot of people comatose yeah well going back to what i originally said about you know the fact that we're an entirely new person every seven years or the ship that goes across the ocean and gets repaired i think the same thing stands here i think the principle here is maintaining a stream of consciousness it's like can you keep the soul what makes you you can you, you know, maintain a stream of thoughts through that entire time? That's the the North Star that the rest of the system coalesces around. Um, so whether we're integrated into a machine or not, whether our brains are thinking at, you know, 10x more frames per second, time slows down for us, we're embedded with many, I don't think it changes anything. As long as we can maintain the soul of who we are, keep that running, I, I don't think anything will change. I think that is, yeah, I think that answers that. So this is maybe more of a thought experiment because I think technically it'd be very hard to implement, but this stream of consciousness idea, if you were to, you could simulate that and fake it. So if someone, when someone goes to sleep and wakes up, there's an interruption to consciousness and, but they still recognize they're the same person. And there's that idea. If you were to just generate a brain in in a jar with memories preformed to believe that it, it, it had always existed up until that point in time, that it thinks it was conscious throughout, but so what what I I mean maybe it's all it's all too much of a, a thought experiment because to to create something like that would have to be very advanced. Yeah, it's it's the same kind of thought as if um it's like when somebody when somebody dies um in the future, we've got this certain thing around preserving the body and you know recreating a version of themselves from the brain. It's not gonna be you. It might be a clone of you that thinks they're you, but the original mm-hmm. you died. <laughs> and that, that's just uh that's just a clone. It with your memories, your beliefs, it thinks it's you, but it's not. It's then when you have that moment with it where you tell it's it's not you. Does it believe you? Does it, you know, what what becomes to its reality? That is it's the concept of we're our own self-reality how we perceive the world around us. And if that's given significant dissonance, then that's what might lead to what you were su- suggesting, John, with that um, comatose state where we're just sleepwalking through life because our brain's just fundamentally disconnected from its own context. So it's it's maybe, as you said, a bit too much of a thought experiment, but it's going to become a very interesting form of debate over the next 10 to 15 years as companies like Neuralink make more and more advances into that. Um, it's probably mm. going to be one of the most hotly contested things on the planet 
because you know if you think about how much people already view technology in this lens of a dystopia when things like that are possible they've proven it works with people who are you know paralyzed from the neck down they've managed to save them reconnect their neurons to their spinal cord the neuralink works perfectly they control control robot legs or whatever and yeah and that works and it's like well how can we use this next what's the next group oh, that yeah. is gonna, mm. And there's a big desire for immortality. And as you say, the, the, the cryogenic technology and people, mm. to, there will be people pushing to do that. And so then it comes down to, as you say, does, is consciousness defined by a consistent stream? And is there a difference between all of your cells and your body changing every seven years, gradually piece, piecemeal versus if you were to just swap them all right now well, and there was still a maintained thread of consciousness? Well, is it, time is kind of like... Um... You know, the way we perceive that's that seven years, that's quite an arbitrary unit of time that we call seven years. It's like if you're able to speed that process up and maintain the order and the structure of it, you know, it, it, we don't, it, we're talking about things that are on the edge of our understanding of biology and physics here. But I think the core premise is that stream of con uh, consciousness idea. And I don't think there is as much of a break between sleeping and waking up than a lot of people believe. I think, you know, you can measure somebody's brain activity. It's pretty bloody active, you know, while, while, while we're there dreaming. And our brains are capable of rendering some pretty astonishing environments all on their own without any thought from us. It just reads your subtext of what you've been thinking about, maybe mashes together a few emotions and hormones that are laying around all over the place and generates this fantastical reality for us to go through. Um, and we don't even understand that yet. But it shows that the brain is capable of self-maintaining itself over a period where we're not directly involved in the day-to-day. Um, so if you if you figure out a way to sort of implement a machine to, to harness that electrical activity that's ongoing, plug it into all the right parts of your brain to kind of manipulate that, that's when we get the kind of reality shifting effects that a lot of the sci-fi focuses on. Like, yeah, it's a really exciting space. Um. <laughs> Super exciting. Um, I'm very bearish on it. I'm not sure. Like, I think that like maybe phase one could be something like this, but I think the biology always snaps back. And I, I personally, like, we can keep going into all the depths of consciousness and the periphery of what's possible. This is fun. Uh, but I think, like, um, it, biology is no, nothing is zero sum. So, like, if you're trying to extend life, you're going to get there's going to be some trade off that you don't realize. And you're not going to realize it until you're far enough down the road. And who's to say that the systems aren't going to adapt and then fight back? Like, you know, antibiotics is a great example. Like we have these antibiotics. It's, mm -hmm. it's just in the same mm -hmm. way you're talking about snapping a chip in. Like all of a sudden we pop a pill. It's amazing. Or, you know, animals with like, uh, uh, I don't know if you all know about this, but to get cows to grow faster so they can get them to market faster, they put hormones behind their ears. Uh, and it's like a slow releasing hormone tablet to give them steroids. None of that is zero sum. We, we act as if it is, but it's not. It's, it's, it, and, and those systems are fighting back to us now, right? Like bugs are becoming more uh, um, deadly and they're, they're resisting antibiotics. And I think something along those lines will happen again with this type of interface where we try to speed things up. We try to cure Parkinson's because we, you know, increase the neural bandwidth uh, and introduce something that's able to help control our neurological systems and all that type of stuff. Um, but I, I'm a big fan of complexity and complexity theory and physics and whatnot. And I think that all of these systems are far more complex than we even understand. And introducing an external agent like this could potentially give us some type of use cases that are rather astounding and could create these type of cyborgs um, further than we already are cyborgs um, into like a direct connection that is truly astounding. I mean, especially with like, I mean, I think like brain balancing and, and helping brain issues and things like that could could honestly create people that would be otherwise comatose and make them somewhat functioning mm -hmm. individuals. I think all of that is possible, but the depths of it is where I start thinking nature's going to fight back on one side. I suppose they, what, what ahead, you're yeah. saying is that like we we come in with a sledgehammer with our rudimentary understanding of what we think the operant forces are in a system. We have no idea of the deeper layers and the deeper layers. And then we end up causing some unexpected reaction, like the the antibiotics. I mean, I've I've got a friend who's developing. He's he's in drug development. He's a, he's a founder of a um, fecal transplant uh, mm -hmm. drug. So it's it's sp specifically to cure Clostridium difficile, which is a uh, an infection of the large bowel. And there's many use cases for it. We we've seen that, that we're at the the start of understanding the role of the microbiome in in the 
gut brain axis and in the role in chronic disease and all of this stuff. And he told me that not only do we have a, mu- a gut microbiota, but those bacteria have a nanobiome. Yes. So, so that those bacteria actually have their own bacterial mm-hmm. environment within them. And they have a picobiome, which is absolutely mind-blowing. And I'm sure 30, 40 years ago, that wouldn't even be on the, the scene. So he's like, so if you come in with and try and just replace something on the level of understanding that we think we have, and you miss out on all the the, the equivalent of the nano and the picobiome, you could end up just completely fudging it. So yeah, wow. very, uh, that, very frightening. Yeah, like the equivalent of that on a macro scale would be like removing the Sahara Desert from the, the earth and then watching how the weather systems change over time, right? It's like <laughs> you're removing this big part and then it's going to cause like a, nom- like a knock-on effect that will just impact systems on a complexity that we have no idea. Um, you try and turn the Sahara Desert into Dubai 2.0, with mm-hmm. loads of like resorts and hotels and pools and like a an atmosphere chamber to keep the weather nice and, and as you say then it <sighs> that messes up all of the like everyone in green in like Iceland suddenly dies <laughs> and we have this like heat wave coming from yeah it it's uh, it's a scary prospect and what what I'm interested in really is how like so you you said we're we're kind of at the the point of the transition from web two to web three. Mm what where will it seep in first what's the what's the early signs of this starting to work like because i i mean from a consumer perspective the the closest thing i i don't know if this is even web three pass phrases so Mm. replacing passwords and two-factor authentication with something that is verified on a on an external place yeah yeah that's that's very powerful yeah I mean, you, you have the one, the single sign in for the entire internet, right? And then you can start to build up more of a system, more of a definitive, you know, system in place around the crypto wallet. Um, so a wallet functions as a, an email address, a password, you know, a unique identifier, a bank account. It's got so many concurrent use cases and it's just such a powerful and simple tool to start building new applications around. And exactly as you said, that might be one of the first things to happen because you know, uh, websites can just open up and say you can sign in with your wallet instead. They can have a further section of, and I think KYC will become real identity verification of actually having to submit, you know, a passport photo or a driver's license. I think that's going to become a lot more common around the internet too, because you can have your simple unique identifier. If you can attach that to it, it's X times more powerful as well. Um, Who, that's an interesting crossover because what is a passport that's issued by a country which has defined its limits as a mm. as a line on the on the ground and then who do you submit the passport to to verify and why are they the boss you, you know you know what i mean yeah. there's like this crossover of centralization we and decentralization use, we use a system um called yoti um so it's an ai sort of record that you, you you send a scanned copy of an id in it goes through their systems you know, if the photo is a bit blurry or not quite, then it goes to a human. If not, the AI can kind of recognize exactly what the kind of right tint should be and the, the structure of it and the layout is pretty accurate. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting concept that no matter how decentralized and borderless and bankless we all become, there is still that cutoff point. It all flows back to a government somewhere. Who are, and I think that's a simple, po- the single point of failure for a lot of things if you want to get into that rabbit hole. But yeah. I suppose unless you run the com- if you run the country like a DAO and you've got basically like the equivalent mm-hmm. of Uber drivers doing the verification, so it's just anyone that wants to make a couple of dollars in their spare time can just verify passports. Yeah, yeah that's the build ideal. A com- you build a community, <laughs> right? What you're saying there is you build a community that's taking care of the authentication for you, right? You still need. I think the one thing with Web three and the way that you just described it is you still need people, right? You still need some type of low hanging fruit. It could be more decentralized and you can build it within the system to take care of it for you, but there still needs to be some type of verification. And yeah, I think the first couple of use cases that you, we're already starting to see is definitely like the password, password, right? Like one password that you're able to go interoperable. I think the next big phase shift that's going to happen in the consumer side is now because you have that, your data can go be- between different things. So you can have like, email for example that you could just have a different email skin to it because you move over to this other you know one company versus another company um and i also think like 
marketing, like I said before, pretty much powered a lot of the machine learning development. I think finance already has been powering a lot of the blockchain development. Mm. And I think, especially now with like JP Morgan talking about making a wallet and a lot of different uh, big financial houses talking about Web3 and things like that, I think you're going to see decentralized finance, but not necessarily decentralized finance of automating cryptocurrency purchases, but automating portfolios. So how are you moving things between your asset allocations and all the type of stuff? You can code that into a smart contract that will take care of all of that for you based off of the conditions that you sent. send. I mean, for everything from the use case I always use to call back to a previous episode is, you know, you buy a solar panel. Your solar panel is hooked up to your house and then it feeds into the grid. And then the money you're paying off, you know, that you're making off of feeding power back into the grid when you're over capacity can immediately go to be paying off the debt that you you took on for that, right? So I think solutions like that will start cropping up as well. Um, not necessarily mm. in the crypto sense, but using crypto for real world, you know, dollar or pound transactions. That Yeah, that, that was a great use case you just touched off on there with energy and, you know, being able to input it back into the grid and receive a form of compensation for that. And you, you can use smart contracts plus tokens as a form of incentivization to stabilize an electricity grid. Like you can literally have individual homes that are feeding back their renewable energy into the grid at certain peak times, which may reward tokens more than other times. You can use smart contracts to automate the distribution of all of this. It's just such an eloquent system. And it's like, well, you can do that with traditional. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, but blockchain does it better. It does it smarter, does How? It more efficiently. How do you avoid getting rinsed by that? So, you know, this example of is it Mercedes that is now charging monthly for the heated seats. So they're charging you for <laughs> a feature that's already in the hardware of your car as a monthly subscription. And it's like ridiculous. all the stuff ridiculous. about, yeah, like the, you know, just being rinsed by the energy companies and, and the lack of the asymmetry of information and we're totally at the mercy, like, well, you know, it sucks to be you because if you want to use your light at home, then you've you've just got to pay, and that's you know how do you well, eliminate a, that as a that's the point of um, renewable energy, right? And having that is is almost like the the way that blockchain is a decentralization of finance. Having renewable energy at home is a decentralization of energy, right? It increases the number of nodes in a system as opposed to concentrated with several power plants. You've just distributed okay. the entire system among millions of nodes around a country. It balances everything out. It levels it out. Like just from simple things on the hardware spec side, you're, you're a lot closer to where the electricity goes. It loses less charge along the lines. It costs less money to get there. It's faster. And then you kind of imagine what that would look like over a country the size of America, for example. It, it's it's absolutely extraordinary what just the simple concept of decentralization and redistributing systems can do. And that's just applying it to energy. You can apply that to a whole lot of other things. So it's the antidote to kind of monopoly forces if, if it, you know, if it mm -hmm. balances out supply and demand of energy use. And Decentralized anyone can then... forces. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. And, you know, my yeah. favorite one is countries. Um, when you apply that to countries. And as you said, the, the DAO system of running something, it's not perfect yet. Like DAOs have a lot of you know work to do. Um, but when I initially went into the Web3 space and I kind of like the ladder of how you usually come into these things, it's like first you hear about crypto. That's the one like Bitcoin's on the news, price action, even your, you know, your grand knows what bit what Bitcoin is, right? Well, then then the kind of the next level to that is learning about NFTs, I feel like. Like you kind of go on your your gradual step up journey here. Once you've got to NFTs, you understand those, you might start hearing about some of the more fringe aspects of blockchain. My favorite one of those is a DAO, so a decentralized autonomous organization. If you're listening in, it basically takes all of these different tools in the blockchain uh, utility box and combines them together to create a DAO, which is taking a bunch of individuals from all around the world who come together. They use smart contracts to automate how the organization makes decisions. So, for example, you can get it set up so somebody can submit a proposal. It will be there visible on the blockchain. Everybody can vote on that proposal using tokens. So they have to spend. So they're, you know, everybody's suitably incentivized to vote for things that they actually mean, um, make decisions. Once the pro proposal is approved, it can go through to different levels. And then finally, once the entire DAO agrees that that's how something should be done, it's published or the uh, command is executed, which transfers funds from somewhere or pays a contractor to do something. 
We've already seen some great examples of this, like the failed attempt to buy the US Constitution, which got outbid by the uh, one of the guys at a hedge fund by, I think, about $2 million. They, they pulled together $47 million to buy the Constitution. And it's a group of about nine or 10,000 people, and they did it in something like seven days. Um, so you take a use case like that and you think, okay, what can a very motivated group of 100,000 people do who really want to see a specific goal succeed? Yes, it could be a balancing point to centralization. Like you get a lot of efficiencies with scale and a mm -hmm. lot of efficiencies with centralization. But what that actually blinds you to is the fragility and how brittle that system is. Centralized systems are incredibly brittle. You get a lot of efficiency out of them, but they cannot re react to external shocks. Our supply chain is an, an incredible use case of this. It's aw awesomely efficient. It's awesomely centralized and how one thing goes for another thing that daisy chains all the way through, you know, to get you socks from China into the UK or Pelotons in the US or whatever it may be, right? Mm -hmm. Like parts have to come from all over the world mm -hmm. um, in order to convene together to get it. But the second cobalt mines go on strike somewhere, you're no longer getting an iPhone because it's an incredibly centralized process, right? If you decentralize it, you give up efficiency in some means, right? You can't just scale things up and all of a sudden get larger and larger returns. You have to copy it. You have to copy the decentralization all throughout the system. Mm -hmm. So it's it's almost linear in that sense. But by doing that, you can adapt to changes. So you can adapt in the sense of this hedge fund guy has you know 30 years of money that he's piled up to be able to, on a whim, flip a switch and say, I'm going to pay $49 million instead of $47 million for the copy of the US Constitution. But the same means seven days, all these thousands of people were able to self-assimilate and organize in order to be able to do the same thing, right? And they were able to do that much faster than it took that guy to get that stack of cash, right? So it's it's more nimble. Yeah, it's it's modular, I think, is a key component here too. You know, just to take a very extreme example, um, what you said about a cobalt mine, you know, for example, a sufficiently powerful group of um, high net worth, ultra high net worth individuals you know, I think will be very influential in the future. But that, for example, you could have, you know, the top 10 richest people in the world form a DAO that is actually, you know, an all-in-one modular system. So you can actually have a decentralized cobalt mine, which is very simple input output DeFi marketplace to actually bid on the sale of the outputted cobalt um, open sourced finances that anybody can inquire to anybody can suggest protocols for improving it you essentially get access to a distributed hive mind of people to improve on an open network of a, of a system it's incredible um, so i think like super PACs, you know in, in in the future there are going to be distributed networks of all-in-one systems like you can get an off-the-shelf production facility or production line for a specific product you know, say I'm I'm a wool manufacturer. Okay, well, great. You can get a, a sheep farm, um, the production facility, the, everything that you need, the raw materials, all feeding into this in one place. So you know, it, it's it's fun to sort of just you know think about what these systems might end up looking like. But using sort of first principles thinking, think of the future result that you want to create and work backwards from there. It's quite simple to see how things could evolve to reach a point like that. I'm not predicting that it will but it's certainly a possibility. It's a good way of looking at it because you're then preempting what possible problems could we run into and how do we hedge against that rather than think rather than a binary fully decentralized or fully centralized. Yeah. It's going to have to be mixed, right? Like just like I was saying in the beginning, like web one became web two became web three. You still have static websites that are read only, right? Like you don't lose what's, what else is there. And I mean, I think you're going to have to have a mixed system in some means of decentralized and, and centralized. However, I think the more decentralized we go, the more adaptive to change we will be. And I think this technology, web, you know, blockchain could actually give us a means to be able to get there on a more of a smooth carrier landing as opposed to like a, a hard transition. Yeah, it's, it's very hard to decentralize authority itself. It's, you know, we can we can do all of the, all we like to skirt around the outside of things to build them back better, but you can never replace, you know, the, 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 the police, right? It's like the police are always going to be the police. There's always going to be people that break a law that is binding and that, that is centralized. So it's almost like, let's abstract that out further and say justice. You can't decentralize justice. Like, not unless you're thinking 300 years in the future, you can then kind of imagine a way that justice could be, you know, 
but done like that. But that's going to be one of the things that prevents full decentralization is that provenance of the central authority. Well, that, that's the enforcement of justice, but you could possibly decentralize the actual writing of the law um, in a petition style way where it, the problem is it requires each voter in the system to have some degree of technical understanding of like why each law is in place and how the laws interact and and maybe we were we run into the the well, microbiome problem you where use, if you could use sorry you could use weighted token weighted distribution there so you know for example people could be on not a scale of zero to 100 in terms of how impactful their vote is but something like 70 to 100 and by completing certain courses and understanding that you understand certain philosophical philosophical ethical models um, and you understand reasoning and you can abstract, that would then push you further from 70 to 100. I am so up for that. Like I've, I've always, <laughs> that's been my my hobby horse for a while that every vote is not equal because mm -hmm. th th there's what's what the uncontrolled variable is level of ignorance, isn't it? Yeah. So if you can standardize for that, brilliant. <laughs> yeah, so that, that would be a very interesting use case of how to design that system um, to actually weight everybody's vote. And then the also the, the the social aspect of it needs to be changed too. That's another big flaw in voting is that you only get maybe forty five to fifty percent turnout anyway. Um, with mm. decentralization and because it's a ball mm -hmm. it is. It is because well, you, I mean, you have to go and got to go and queue up in a post office with you know for half an hour and then write on it. And for some reason, they've not managed to make that into a. Well, you know, in the like, UK, not when, we, when we were going through COVID, they used they pushed out notifications to every mobile device. They actually used the uh, mobile carriers, kind of partnered with them to only send out a broadcast level uh, notification to every phone in the UK saying we're in lockdown. You know, why don't they do that, that for voting? Yeah. And if you're, if you're KYC'd with an attached wallet address, it's actually uniquely verifiable who is voting. Um, you do a little face ID scan before that, have a couple systems in place to verify process seems an easy fix to me so it, it's interesting to hear you say that because whenever i've brought that up with people i'm always met with oh no but it's tech it's technologically so difficult to mm. to have digital voting that it no, wouldn't so even be possible it's in really easy. Not... the only thing that, that that though is security though so like iphones are inherently more secure than android however mm. iphones are always easier to be hacked because everyone who's important has an iPhone, presumably for security, which means there's now an economic incentive to know how to hack iPhones, uh -huh. right? So it's an so, adaptive threat. Yeah. So I would say that that's the problem with that's that's the problem with having it digitized is the means to be able to do that. Now there are protocols in which you can extract that. Like I would actually say, you want something as digital that immediately goes physical, and then all records of the digital is is ephemeral and gone. Because then that's a, I mean, if you had some means to that, you may have to have recall votes and may have to vote again. But that to me is far safer than uh, having it all digital because it would create an incentive. Like blockchains inherently are only as secure as who owns the majority of nodes. If you control mm -hmm. all the nodes, you can control the system. And which means you can, if there's an incentive to be able to do that. But there's a and record I also think the flip, There is a record at least, yes. And there's a public record, which would make it mm -hmm. a lot easier. Uh, to be able to chase down so that you know exactly like this polling place that has these votes is in like i mean a thing in america that we talk about like i don't want to get into the present day election fraud but john f kennedy was elected because of a lot of uh dead people who voted in where my grandparents are from in cicero the mob got john f kennedy to win the presidency because a lot of people who were actually dead voted um so you know there's precincts that they should have had let's say 10,000 votes had 20,000 votes that came in. So if it was something public and be able to, you know, translate on that, you'd be able to catch that right away and say there was voter fraud. And this is an example of what happened. Um, I also think the flip side of this is even if we create a better system, you know, just kind of there's incentives to hack it, but also we need, we need better people than just the ass clowns who are getting elected now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard the word ass clown in a while. That's a, that's a throwback. <laughs> I think it's apropos to politicians. <laughs> yeah, I think it was a very good use of the word. Like, I'm glad it resurfaced under that context specifically, you know. <laughs> yeah, we don't have much luck here. I mean, in the UK, it's kind of been like ass clown. It's been like a clown car, an ass clown car. They just keep coming out one after the other. Well, we, we, we didn't even vote for our current prime minister. 
We haven't voted for the last two. <laughs> They've just been thrust on us. Yeah. Well, certain people got to vote. I think it was 160,000 people or whatever got to vote. Um, we were in a certain party. But who's actually a member, like an official member of a party these days? Like nobody. Um, it's, it's rigged <laughs> from the start. Yeah, I, I think there's a much better way. Like have a Merkel tree of politicians. Just face them off against each other one by one. Like get 50 or 100 candidates and let some actual talent, some actual capability surface from that rather than just letting oil, a load of infighting. Royal Rumble and... style. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, the, if it was an actual Royal Rumble, I think we'd, we'd end up with a pretty good candidate. Mm, mm. I agree. Yeah. And, <laughs> but see, like the thing, though, if we're talking about Web3 and how we can apply that technology to something like this, it allows us to, to, to look at the macro use case of who's getting elected and how are we doing it. But also it leaves us more of a macro or micro use case into like finance like the finance minister in the UK, that's a great example of what, you know, some scandals that are going on with that and how that was poorly handled under trust. But um, what if we actually got to vote for the finance person and people who understood finance were able to have a a stronger representation in their vote casting of of that and then being able to transmit that ledger to say, okay, well, X, Y, and Z, these guys, they make a lot of money. I can see they make a lot of money. I may not be with how they make money, but I can, de- you know, determine from that they understand this money system, and they seem to be against this. Well, now I now I have also people that I can go and chase down and try to learn more and understand. Right? Like, I think it'd be more transparency and, and mm. allow for more curiosity potentially. Yeah, there's that ego that comes into it too, though, because you could say, well, let's open source a country's finances. It's like publish your budget. Let you know a hundred of the smartest minds in the country openly critique this and submit proposals and have like a bug bounty system in place but for processes and mm. like opening up and saying well there's 500 grand to anybody that designs us a better economical model here and can prove it with math then it gets peer reviewed by you know scientists at notable universities and this whole debate is happening in a public town square and just view from it's Not like sexy it's so good like it destroys the current system we have available and if you actually abstract this out it is just unbelievably better than what we have right now so why doesn't that happen ego from a from an audit perspective as well because we you know that i think both of our countries are resp- we we know that some of the ass clowns are responsible for pilfering <laughs> public money and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The, there's no re- you know so we the, there's a guy actually john i think you'd love to have him on um, he is in health tech in the UK and his mission is public money, public code. Mm. If we're going to be using a public healthcare system, we should not be using closed source software suppliers mm. for patient data and proprietary systems. So, um, he, and yeah, he, he's, he, I'll, I'll put you in touch with him, but, uh, that's, that seems like a, an obvious one. And, to your point, Josh, like having bounties in place for saying, let's mm-hmm. identify inefficiencies mm-hmm. and you completely outsourcing that stuff. And then all the code is verified. It's all transparent. And then that can be used to the amount of savings, at least in healthcare, mm-hmm. trying yep. to transfer, like e- even in a single trust, um, transferring a patient from one town to another within the same region, but they use different systems for patient notes or they have one uses paper and one uses <laughs> digital system. And you, you, that that's dangerous in itself from a patient care perspective, but it's so expensive that you, you're having to like try and fit these systems that aren't designed to, to match together. So yeah, I love that bounty idea. Yeah. yeah, if I still smoke, this is the moment I would light a cigarette and say, let's just end it here. This is amazing. Uh, <laughs> we solved all the problems. <laughs> See, I do smoke and I would yeah, light a cigarette very... right now. And I know that <laughs> you're, you're probably going to be looking at me like, oh, how could you? Um, but oh, I was at, when, you, when you said earlier about starting young, I was that person. I think I started when I was like 14. Um, and it's yeah. just been a habit that keeps coming and going and coming and going and coming. So in, in that case, Josh, how do you feel if, if there was a policy, like, let's say you're 14 again, mm. and someone introduces a policy saying anyone born after the year 2000 doesn't get 
to buy cigarettes anymore. Well, I think the way to do it is to pay people. So, for example, we can calculate that we we spend seven billion a year on healthcare on smoking related healthcare issues. Okay, we'll then take the total population, divide it by a number that's less than seven billion, and that's how much you pay people <laughs> to not smoke. And then, because our wow, you know, so crypto you wallets are linked into a thing, it can actually tell when you've bought cigarettes, and it will subtract <laughs> those tokens from your monthly payout. And you can do this with Ooh. zk Sync, so it's private too. You know, it's it's the same bounty idea. Like, if you take a lot of problems, apply a, apply a certain you know theoretical or abstract framework to a given problem, such as the one that we've developed over the course of recording this podcast episode, you could say we've developed a, a very small, simple abstract system that you could apply or framework that you could apply to any given problem and be able to solve it somewhat yeah but i suppose as you say it's the ethical framework that you use because that that's a mm -hmm. classical med school entrance um interview question of like you've got three patients on the ward one of them is a homeless alcoholic smoker <laughs> um and he's a criminal and he's, he's in because he's got into a fight from stealing someone's handbag patient number two is a a, you know, a neonatal unit transfer two day old baby suffering from this thing mm -hmm. and then the third one's like this obese guy with diabetes and which one do you do you allocate your treatment to and because you know it always raises the thing of ah well it's free at the point of care but how responsible is each patient for their circumstances and how much has their kind of generational trauma impacted mm -hmm. their choices and and so to then say you get a stipend each month for not smoking it it opens a slippery slope like i definitely see the merit in it but i think you'd be met with a lot of resistance for something like that the systems would be resisting it like the medical system would definitely be resisting it <clears throat> i think you'd have far more luck with the individual and, and like you're in, using your lexicon like at the point of care i think it would increase because you it would also be incentivizing the doctors to some degree of checking up on them because the, the patient's going to want you to know that they're, you know what I mean, that they're not smoking because then they're going to be able to keep getting their money. Also, so they can show you their dashboard and say, hey, look, here, here are my stats. Mm. Yeah. Or maybe you take blood and you, there's no nicotine in the system. Right. So like, you know, mm. there's ways of doing it. I don't want the central bank digital currency, like what JW was saying. I'll, I would fight that to death. Yeah. But I mean, mm. I think that they're to this bounty system, I think is great, though, because once again, to like what we've talked before, Yusuf, these type of vices disproportionately affect the lowest among us. Right. So if we're actually giving them incentive and paying them to say like, you're no longer going to smoke and here's money in order to be able to do that, it lowers their costs and it incentivizes them in the short term to create the, the habits in their brain to reward it. And then now they have more money, maybe it's easier for them, but they actually have twice the amount, right? Because they have the money they're saving every month and then they're yeah. also having the money that you're giving them. Right. I mean, that's, that's very compelling. I, and I suppose smoking is a bit easier because you say like most people are like, Mm. apart from like weird twitter gurus who think you should smoke organic tobacco like <laughs> it's it's pretty much like okay smoking's bad for your health yeah. and it's an active addiction but this thing that people have raised about having a body fat tax that's where i think the, wow. the i haven't heard of that there's a lot uh, okay it, it, it's a you know i guess it's a next level of you mm. know the like coca-cola tax where if it's over mm. five grams per hundred mil or whatever but then actual like if it's how fat are you that's a really risky one because, and you can imagine the 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 kickback you'd get from that. Um, I and think we should do it. Well, yeah, it, like it's it's more slippery because it's harder to see other than leathery skin and and certain voice if somebody's smoking or if somebody is overweight. It's you're it's inherently you're almost attacking them personally because it's their personal choices that you know exude who they are and what they present themselves to. So it's philosophically and ethically hard. However, we all obesity is a obesity is a far worse killer than even smoking. You'll you'll die faster from being obese than you are even from smoking. If like I mean, look at the French. Jesus Christ! I talk about this with my wife all the time. Like like they're just they they have such a strong sense of community. They can keep smoking and having cheese all day long, and they barely exercise. Like all my friends who are French, like I exercise like more in two days than they do all year, and it just blows my mind how they're healthier than me. You know what I mean? But like that's the truth of it, right? Um, but you know. To, to that same point though it's it's harder because i think it's harder not only because of the ethical and the you know your you are who you are and what you look like everything the clothes you wear all of it is affected by obesity i also think it's harder because it's so ubiquitous like i can't mm. i can't just reach for a snack right even the fact that i'm hungry i might have a craving for a cigarette but i won't die if i have a cigarette i'll die if i don't eat 
and uh, also yeah. everything has fucking sugar in it and well, yeah, you, we don't talk about it like if you go to the local the, the closest shop to your house and you say i want a meal that has 30 grams of protein and two grams of fat two grams of carbs good luck trying to find that but if you are like, I need a cupcake within in the next five minutes, you, I'm sure you can find one. So it's, yeah. you're right. The environment's kind of set against us with that. There are also um, a, a non-zero group of people that believe that obesity is not a, um, what, what is the word? Not malleable. Uh, that that, it's, it, that your, your body fat is a fixed state and that you, that you can't alter it well, so, and the, there is no so, so i there's a, there's a gp in the uk who I, I did a kind of rebuttal video about who believes that um obesity has no no increase on your your general mortality and medical risk um, well, they're wrong like it's not a debate or a case of they're wrong <laughs> like they deny science they're out of the discussion if you're not going to actually contribute using rational schools of thought you're gone bye bye <laughs> right <laughs> like i hear people say that i keep going around to it like oh no you know you can be x fat and still be healthy or it doesn't yes no you're wrong like you can't just deny everything that we've learned over the past hundred years because it suits your eth ethics for the month kind of thing yeah it, it's a bit of gymnastics because say you can be x fat and still be healthy or, or you you can be obese and not have health complications well yes you can run across the road blindfolded multiple times and you might get to the other side and it'd be okay well, obese is a health complication. It's not like saying that and health, like obesity in itself, just that is a health complication because you're very, you find it hard to do simple tasks. It affects, you know, society because there has to be like things, re additional resources allocated to you. That is a health concern. Obviously. Yeah. In, in term, if you were to define a disease as like a drop in your functional status, then you'd say that that yeah, in itself yeah. is a, is a complication. I suppose the the difficulty is the level of agency in someone who, is obese even though like you, I mean, if you asked an alien and you said this person's smoking and this person eats too much they'd say well surely they're both making a free choice to do the thing and therefore the like they are equally culpable but what we're not including is like the the set of choices and set of events and childhood trauma and things that's led them to that point and that compulsion well, what I'd like to take into account is how it affects other people. It's like, I think something's fine to make a choice if it doesn't harm other people. However, when you have a finite number of resources, um, such as a, a governmental healthcare service, for example, the NHS, they're having to over allocate resources to treat people because of the dumb decisions they make. And now all of a sudden you have people that are in there through no fault of them, their own have been injured in an accident. And now they lost a leg because they couldn't find a doctor in time because resources were over allocated to obese people. It's like, how far down the chain do you go? It's the same with smoking to be, as well, to be honest. It's like, maybe you shouldn't be, maybe those people should have some kind of restriction put in place because down the line, statistically, it will start to harm other people. So a very simple solution that doesn't require kind of like a complicated scoring system and sophisticated like um, coefficients and things would just be 50 pound entry fee to A&E. To, to, to the the ed for americans um which then filters out people who coming who are coming into the emergency department because well i saw my gp and i wasn't happy with what, with what they told me so <laughs> i've come here but then it disproportionately affects the people who maybe are on the bread line and are false positives as uh, false false negatives so they yeah. do have a legitimate problem but they're scared of the 50 pounds or they they um that's priced them out so it's a really tough problem to solve. I, th I think starting from the base, it's very simple to add taxes onto things. Like use what we know already, like people aren't going to like it. But if you actually really sell it as this is a fix to sort of help out people who are suffering from certain problems while making it more expensive for people to want to get into that in the first place, like on really high fatty sodium, you know, foods, just have an additional tax there. So if you're going to the supermarket to buy a giant cereal box of like frosted, I don't know, whatever's, then just make it a bit more expensive for the person who's buying them, you know, and apply that cost to both the customer and to the manufacturer to discourage both sides of the demand and the supply. And you can use that fund to then subsidize whole foods or things that are, you know what I mean? You could practically make healthy foods affordable for everybody by doing something like that then, right? So I... 
I like that idea in principle, but then you, you're going to have some like, if it fits your macro style bodybuilder, who's 8% body fat. And it's like, do you know what? I love pop tarts. And I, because I track my macros, I can fit these into my calorie budget and still remain lean. And I'm being punished because I can't have my pop tarts. <laughs> You just gotta pay of, for it. You're, you're not even punished. You just yeah, gotta pay you for it. Pay for it. Yeah, I have to pay yeah. for all the vices that I like, right? Like, yeah. Think how much taxes on a pack of cigarettes. I come back from the airport. I'm paying what two or three pounds for a packet. Come back to the UK. It's like sixteen pounds. <laughs> it's all tax. It's like, well, you know, I know that smoking is healthy. I gotta pay, you know, over the over the top for how much I should do. Well, pop tarts aren't healthy for you either, so maybe you should have to pay a bit of extra for that too. So you could say, even though I'm a marathon runner. I should st- I still have to pay full price for my cigarettes, even though I've kind of neutralized my my health outcome. Yeah, totally right. <laughs> yeah, I think that's overcomplicated. If, if you're saying right, because then you do introduce reintroduce what you were saying before about a complicated scoring system and coefficients and how mm, do you measure just exercise against a yeah, it, it overcomplicates things. Just keep it simple to begin with. See what can be done in a couple of years. See how people receive it. Then build from that. Because I suppose the other thing is, if you know, if, let's say we've all got wearables and they're tracking multiple, multiple biometric data mm. and giving us a single score for you know expected life, life expectancy or something like that. And if you can extend that, then your annual tax goes down, and that could be verified mm. externally as well. The downside is if you've got some kind of familial hypercholesterolemia, you've got some some other factor that's affecting your your expected life length or your potential burden on the healthcare system. That's can you hard. isolate that though? What's could you-, you isolate and tell? Because you could track multiple things. Like you could say that your blood sugar is increasing and then we're seeing a follow on effect of this other condition. So we could reliably say that that's due to eating. However, however with this, there's none of those telltale signs present um, that would indicate it's a specific thing. So we could isolate that incident and say, okay, that doesn't count. This could all be automated. You, you, it's a very interesting. You could, that, that would introduce more complexity again. Or you could just say, humans are a spectrum. What's the mean? Let's let's focus on the mean and create all this whole tax or whatever levy system on top of it towards the mean because there's going to be genetic anomalies in every direction and either you're you're chasing the anomalies because the other thing is you're also chasing is the introduction of new chemicals that we're constantly having there's going to be some introduction of new some complex carbohydrates or some like derivative of sugar that's based off of like I don't know cow farts or something and it's like you know this great thing and it's 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 labeled something else like you know. Uh, what was that uh, fish that's actually just tilapia? Chilean sea bass. It's like just rebranded something else and all of a sudden it's no longer uh, you know, as unsexy as corn syrup. You know what I mean? It's 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 just sugar, it's fine, it's whatever, it's in here. Um, so you're you're gonna end up chasing that too. Instead, I, I feel like what's the mean understanding, the average understanding of what it is to be a healthy and thriving individual? And let's incentivize that. Like we talk about taxes, but taxes are just another mean of incentivizing behavior. I think that's really what we want. And that's something we can do with Web3. Like it doesn't necessarily have yeah. to be at the central currency level, but what if in the healthcare system level, you know, it understands my behaviors and it's giving me a discount yeah. on my bill or a discount if I mm-hmm. go to the emergency room, you know, like I, I know from talking in a lot of people in the data science community, people who go to the emergency room tend to be the most to repeat offenders and going to the emergency room. So we can be able to understand like, well, why are you going to the emergency room? How are you going to the emergency room? And you can change the levies of the taxation on that person or the cost to that person to either go up and down based off their condition. Like mm. if it's my and neighbor down voluntary. the street, yeah. If it's my neighbor down the street, he has to go to the emergency room because he almost dies constantly, right? Versus somebody who's only going because they can't afford it. And their only means to get there is once it's too bad, right? Yeah, I see. So so I, I suppose you're saying you've got to control for the the controllable factors and the um, the things that are just, you know, emergent phenomena. Yes. The only mm. thing with the medical system that you would have to do from the outset, if you're going to induce introduce like policy level changes, you would need that to be the full stack. So currently, if we were to go by like let's say U.S. government guidelines for diet or that kind of stuff, and there's still the the hangover of all of the funding from the Grain Commission and you know, dairy and all, all this kind of stuff, like the food, the old, the old food pyramid. And so it would have the, the, the evidence basis for that <laughs> stuff would have to be decentralized as well. Mm. Um, and luckily with, you know, with people wearing wearable devices and huge amounts of data that we can collect, then suddenly we've got so much data points and we can, we can accelerate the advancement of mm medical science we've got huge cohort studies we've got massive observational studies that we can now do and 
pull out the data and draw correlations and things, um, and then create policy based on that. You're talking about decentralizing the healthcare system, which I would be all for as well, because it would take it away from the incentives at big corporations who write the laws to more people who are actually actively, you know, doing the implications. Like, okay, Yusuf, something I think about a lot is I would love to get my testosterone tested. I think this all the time, especially after reading your your uh, essay on it or your your blog post mm-hmm. on it, because I've eliminated pretty much all external um, estrogen in my life, like from nice. plastics and all of the fragrances. All that, it's mm-hmm. not there anymore. Um, Brilliant. So, like that type of thing is another decentralized understanding use case, right? Like, you know, it's it's just from people blabbering that happen to be unfortunately caught in the conversation with me talking about testosterone, which happens probably more often than I would like to admit. Uh, that, but that would that would be able to get introduced back into the zeitgeist as opposed to now, where it's everything is top down. Like, no, it has to be coming from this corporation who actually funds the government to actually make the policies. Yeah, in terms well, of the way economic- to do that. Sorry, Sorry, I just thought that the company to set up would be uh, the way to do it really um, would be setting up a decentralized insurance provider. Um, And then you have a a voluntary thing where you can get people to have these wearables, which are submitting daily biometric updates. Once they do that, you can actually have a dynamic um, insurance plan that updates every month. You have a smart contract that's integrated with somebody's account and just takes a um, a predetermined amount based on what their bio, bio, like the mean or the trend of their biometric snapshots. You can then have very early interventions for things like cancer. You can screen for things super early. Like I think that like if you set up a decentralized insurance company with a pre like a treasury um, or, or a certain war chest to develop it, you can have decentralized operatives kind of running the day to day operations of the com- of the company. Like the call center could be decentralized. People just pick up the phone and do it. It's like a gig worker economy. Mm. You have to go through training, pr- prove you've done, done a certain thing. Calls can be monitored and tracked mm. and you can just be bl- blocked from the system. It's a very interesting business model to, to create. The, the, there used to be an app called Sweatcoin. I don't know if you ever saw it. it yeah. It's a similar kind of thing, but it was for like, you, you wouldn't get anything cool. It'd be like cinema vouchers or you could get like um, some, <laughs> you know, some, some crap reward for doing mm. a certain number of steps you'd earn tokens and you, yeah, but certain if they give you a Fitbit or something and then that's the way they do it. Something you mentioned there that I'm quite excited by is this gig economy thing, because you could, if you're the average person with no job and you've got a certain skill set, you no longer have to go and work for a particular company. You could sign up to three or four of these services and then just take inbound calls having done the the training and you could basically be doing a third a third of a job three times for example so it's similar to yeah. if you were someone who does uber eats deliveroo and um something else as like your your job and you just pick up um deliveries where they when they come in yeah, you've done something, you've said some a couple of things that are really, really interesting there. So for example, going back to what we said earlier with identity on chain, people are not going to want to switch crypto wallet addresses ever. Because like, say you're that Uber driver, you're going to be building up your reputation that's rubber stamped onto your crypto wallet address. And then say you want to move jobs, you can say, hey, look at my wallet address history. I never was late for a single shift in the whole uh... four years I was doing that. So now I want to go join another company as a consultant because I've been studying, I don't know, blockchain development in, you know, part-time during this. I've got all of my licenses, certifications, coursework grades um, also attached to this ID. I can point at everything, say it's verifiable, go work for this company. Now I'm doing gig work in kind of a de- development projects, building up a reputation score along that as well. All of this is going to be attached to a single wallet address. So I think the main issue is going to be stealing and getting access and hacking people's addresses and also never wanting to switch them. It's like you're going to be assigned one the, mo- the moment you turn 18 and that's going to be your 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 identity forever. And then you attach a digital twin to that with AI. Never wanting say, to switch and it. And that's going to be a massive thing as well. That's if you've got good reputation. But if, if you fuck it, then you just go, oh, you know what, I'll just start a new wallet. I don't think that's going to be possible. I think it's going to be um, like there are certain ways that you can set it up so that you can only have one of these things because the Ethereum network could tell when somebody switches uh. and just blocks everything. 
So I think it's going to be like there'll be laws put in place most likely to kind of, you know, cement this as a policy. Wow. So you'd be permanently accountable. If, if you were late for work once, then that's on your record forever. That's the dystopian yeah. black meter future that China is already doing. China has smart contracts for uh, right now employed for uh, prison sentences. So if you use like certain things that you're like, you know, um, you know, like trivial offenses of not being uh, ordinate while you're in prison, you can get tacked on uh, through smart contracts more. Uh, really? Yeah, yeah, it's already so, in place. So, so we, testing it out. We we have like a arbitrary threshold where we say, if you're a sex offender, then that deserves to be on your list, on your your thing forever, and that restricts whether you can live near a school and all this stuff. But if you if you like stole something from a shop, that shouldn't go on your permanent record. And well, whereas if it's just if you, everything. If, if, yeah, if you've been caught for a sex offender, you could actually programmatically stop that person from being within three miles of a school, for example. <laughs> Like, you know, because the ho the home registry is like buying a house, taking out a mortgage would be on chain too. So you could literally just have a blacklist and say, if you've committed X crime, you cannot purchase X item or you cannot apply for X job. Like it really then does devolve into this dystopian future where, you know, you can just, China already does it with social credit scores and everything through WeChat. They can just control every aspect of somebody's life now the big question that we have arrived at here is one of utilitarianism right because it's like well if a system is you know if you could tell theoretically that system would do more good but it restricts is it good or is it bad well i, I think a complexity comes in i think even the means of what we're talking about we're not yeah. we're, we're ignorant to the areas of it that we're blind to um and no i mean once again i don't think anything is zero sum but if we're talking back about the iPhone Android scenario, building a system like this, I think is inherently unstable because it incentivizes somebody to come at the top and control it all. Right. So like I would like a system in which we don't have laws or crime on chain because I think it'd be incentivizing. <laughs> it would, it would, it would feed a beast to incentivize that continuing and going forward because it's a, it would be a, a God, it would be such a great means of controlling the population. And you know, that would just mean that somebody's going to come in and try to do it at the top um who and what and how i mean we don't know but i mean i think history is enough to say that if there's a system that becomes king of the hill it, it's just going to eventually continue to, on that until it utterly co collapses right well if, if it's abusable it's going to be abused of course yeah the system <laughs> the i mean the roman empire though. yeah roman empire of course that's a great example like you know the mm -hmm. republic formed in which they had all these people in this a million brilliant means of economy and militarism which they, you know, praise through their ancestors, this culture of glory seeking. And then all of a sudden there's just mm -hmm. more and more and more glory that you're seeking until the point where someone has to be at the top. And then somebody came in, you know, Augustus and created a new system. Instead of you trying to get glory, you're trying to get praise from the empire emperor and the emperor is this godly deity type mm -hmm. system and type person. And then that perpetuated on for a while until it devolved into a military dictatorship. And that's kind of how it ended up ending. Um, this could end up going the same way because, you know, we talk now about sex offenders, but let's start defining what is a sex offender is thinking about committing a crime, committing a crime, right? Is, is Google what's searching? That film? What's that film um, where they, they predict that you're going to minority report. It? Oh, minority report. Minority yeah. report. I actually built a beta That's of one. something similar That's to this. One. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it can tell that you're thinking about the crime. Then they arrest you before you ever commit it. So you oh, don't even wow. have a chance to commit right. crime. So it's like you can, you, this goes back to the chip in the head, like we could actually A-B test this across multiple different people. So we could l allow people to commit crimes, look for patterns in their sort of hormonal levels and, you know, electrical impulses in their brain. We could say this is a very typical example of what the brain does when somebody's preparing to commit a crime. And then you could actually have people on the scene there and stop it before it ever happens and arrest them for it. Because you could tell what they're, what they're actually <laughs> well, so going you, to do. You, so you send the police car to the guy who's about to commit the crime and you go up. Oh, just in case we knew yeah. what yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow but i mean the only thing appealing about a system like that is if it worked if you know there'd be anomalies um you could you, that that would be the, the way that you get rid of it for good um I, yeah but i see once again going back to decentralization i think it's far safer of a system to have it be socially i mean our, our, we are inherently social beings so if we have like an ethics that is shared amongst us and we apply that ethics to some means of understanding who and what we are and our environment is, I feel like that's the best means of trying to socially police ourselves as opposed to having records that go away. Cause I mean, like 
shit. I mean, mm-hmm. I, we've all done horrible things and we've all definitely thought more horrible things than we've actually acted out. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. mean that we are who we are back to your every seven years changing. Oh, right? Yeah. So there's the, the social policing, there's the decentralization of the justice system, and there's the execution of the justice system, which you said, mm. Josh, that um, policing would have to be still a centralized group of people. I'm wondering whether, like, I suppose because police are, are they're, they're very skilled, at least at least over here, um, that, you know, the amount of training and things required that it maybe wouldn't lend itself very well to a gig economy. You can't you can't well, decentralize. That's, yeah, that's what they have in, oh, what's the book? Snow Crash. Um, they have their decentralized police force, which is named, it's a modular police force, private companies, small task forces that are sent out to respond. And that kind of thing, once you go through a basic training, you're given a certification, you're monitored, you wear a camera that has to be switched on all the time. You could technically decentralize something like the execution of the justice. You could decentralize the formation of the justice and what is held accountable as a standard in the judicial system. Um, it's the most likely the, uh, you could probably, you could probably decentralize incarceration too. You could have standardized modular prisons, like more of them. It's, it's very, very interesting. It's interesting. You can it's like in your house. Yeah. It's um, interesting. The one thing with that though, is to go back to the, the point I was making about like small communities versus larger communities is I think it's inherently safer and better for the community. If the police officer wasn't modular and understood it. So they roll up to the mm. scene and it's like, Hey dude, what's going on? Why are you so angry? As opposed to tackling him, handcuffing him, throwing him in the back of a thing to understand that like, oh shit, like your business just failed, you're drunk, you fell off the wagon, like mm-hmm. all your your life just went completely un, out of control and in disarray and I'm going to have some empathy for you as opposed to I just got a call and I'm fulfilling a gig that I'm going to get uh, well, 75. I, I just want to that's down to them. I just want to put it out that I agree with you. <laughs> I'm just... No, no, I know, I know, I know. This is all a thought experiment. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But th- this is down to the, the the incentive or the the bounty that's given. So if it's the bounty is go and stop that crime and punish that person, and the person gets a notification on their on their device and it says, "Oh, for two hundred quid, half a mile away, there's a crime going on. Go and stop it, or go and like neutralize the, th- the threat." That's a different instruction to go and like talk this guy down from the ledge, kind of thing. It's, um, mm, mm, it's, it's, it's all about what you tell the AI to do, right? Like don't whatever you do, don't tell an AI to make as many paper clips as possible. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think it goes all all the way back to the incentives matter though, too, because if what are we trying to incentivize in our justice system? Or trying to incentivize the execution of it, which even in this conversation, and to Josh your point where you're like, I agree with you, it's so hard for us to even get out of our 1.0 form of the justice system we talk about now, as mm-hmm. opposed to like transcending it. And being able to understand like what is actually the like what are we trying to do with justice are we trying to punish the perpetrator and you know complete the victim or are we trying to heal the society as a whole because if we're trying to heal a society as a whole we're going to try to find a way to stop creating pedophiles as opposed to find a way to punish them right? yeah but then humans aren't very good at abstracting to a degree like if you set an abstract goal like this what you know the task isn't to necessarily arrest this person put them in prison for this long the task is to repair society you, uh, i i i don't think that i think there's a very 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 small set of, subset of humans that are capable of doing that um not everybody is going to be able to be the perfect policeman that we can imagine that like we can all imagine what a perfect policeman they'd be able to talk anybody out de-escalate conflict person uh, perfectly every time that's not the case you know too many police officers are human beings they can go through training evade detection then they shoot somebody from point blank range because they had an argument with their wife last night um and that to me it's like mm. that that's the thing that's in my head it's like that's such a horrible reality that we live in um it's it's obviously a technocrat's dream to be able to institute a form of technology to solve that but there's like at what level of causality do you stop it happening so with the obesity example you know we, we were all talking about like at the point of someone trying to buy a pop tart to make themselves more fat but really if if we say the, the look at the biggest cause of obesity as the ace index or um someone who's experienced childhood adversity and uh abuse sexual abuse as a child well then that's the the the, the causal point of this mm. person becoming obese so do we then need to go back and like say well the the way to prevent obesity is to stop childhood uh, stop child abuse Mm. and and then how mm-hmm. do we and and then 
you go a step further than that. I say, well, what causes child abusers? Well, also child abuse, but maybe other factors. And so so mm. there is a point where we're like, as you say, we have to be very clear on what is the original question or problem that we're solving. And then where are we putting the Facebook pixel? Where, where are you um, mm. setting the direction of everything? What are you optimizing for? Yeah. Yeah. Very salient point there. Um <laughs> It's true, though. I mean, I think what we're getting to is you have to try to think of what are the means of what you're trying to achieve and find the most basic and foundational form of it. Because, I mean, to your point, like, you know, why did why are you abused? Because you were abused as a child. Why was why were you abused as a child? Because you know, your whoever abused you was abused as a child. Like, we have to just bring one link in that chain mm-hmm. and create a, a, an ethics that can then be simple enough to be transformed and continue on. Like, I'm not Christian. I don't want to preface it with this. I'm not Christian. I'm not religious. I don't like any of them. Um, I like all of them, which is why I don't like any of them. I'll put it that way. Um, (laughs) But it's pretty amazing what Christianity gave us all. Like, okay, us two are, us three rather, are, uh, you know, uh, separated by an ocean and a whole bunch of land, right? We're a different size of the Mm -hmm. world. But yet we talk to each other, you know, so flippantly and have such a great understanding of each other. And some of it sure is the fact that we rebelled against you guys in one, of course, um, but some of it is mostly from this set of Christian ethics that permeates the West and completely transformed our entire course of history into saying like, hey, instead of assuming you speak a different language and you wear different clothes, I'm going to kill you because you're an other. It's now going to say, I'm going to try to see you as the same. And instead of saying the haves and have nots, and I'm going to try to, you know, what do whatever I need to do in dog eat dog way to get more of the have and get rid of the have nots. It's no, let's focus on the people who don't have something, right? Like, I feel like we just need a means to understand a shared sense of humanity to heal that one generation and then be able to carry on through the rest and and small, simple mm-hmm. things like the golden rule of Christianity can end up creating new constitutions if it's the Magna Carta or, you know, a bunch of people in a DAO betting on a copy of the constitution. Yeah, it, it, the, perfectly put. The only change is it needs to be broader than one religion. You have to. Right, yeah. it, it, it's almost like humanism, like like creating a really base level, fundamental system of thought that can drive real change. And it's like whenever you see these massive move, movements, people get unbelievably motivated by them. Take political ideology; it has the power to move mountains because of how embedded it embedded it is into everybody's lives. It has that factor that drives people. It's like a cult. You know, it's you'll do fanatical things to to succeed in these ideological goals. If you could create something that encompasses all of that, but does not divide people, actually unifies people. It's like when you're in a religion or in a political group, the there is always another, and that other always happens to be other human beings. It's like well, the the, the way out of that is to create some kind of system of thought and ideology or, or religion where the other is not other people. The other is just lack of progress in general. Like instead of fighting against an outgroup, fight against ourselves, but the bad parts of it. It's like you have to unify people in that way to drive real lasting change. Otherwise, it's just going to be a big old circle of one party gets power. They go one way, then it goes back, then it goes back. So inefficient. You need something that can unify and drive everybody forward. Otherwise, it's just going to be the same, but accelerated by technology. Like it's, yeah, it's it was, tech it, augmented of the same. Yeah, it just yeah. You, you you get the wave point up a notch, you get it down to microwave. It's just going really fast, but it's still just as up and down. It's not as just. We we need to just fire a single electron bullet straight the way through. So I really appreciate the induction you guys have given me into this. I, like it's <laughs> it's a world that I I've not really paid much attention to, and I'm coming away from this feeling like there's a dizzying amount of implications and. A mm-hmm. philosophical urgency mm-hmm. yes. to figure out these these big questions and big problems and i don't know if we will figure them out before it's too late and before the technology is implemented and then we're just gonna have to deal with the the consequences yeah i think web3 um i'll put in one final point before i think i guess we wrap this up it's been a great chat today but web3 is a little bit of a trojan horse i feel like You know, it gets involved with these promises of like financial overhauls and rewards and NFTs and funny cartoon pictures. Before you know it, you're contemplating things that have such a foundational impact on society at large. So it's a little bit of a Trojan horse, I feel like. I feel like whoever Satoshi Nakamoto was probably knew a little bit more about this than he was letting on when he first published that white paper. Kind Mm -hmm. of set in a series of dominoes from that point. 
Could not agree more. I actually did an episode uh, with my buddy Rowan, and we titled it uh, "Web Three's Tro- Web Three as a Trojan Horse" because I could not <laughs> agree with I could not agree with you more. I think it's exactly what it's doing. Um, yeah, great analogy. It, yeah, is there anything that that we should be doing now, like just on an individual level, to expose ourselves to the upside of this or to hedge against the downside? Pay attention to China. Pay attention to central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, who your new prime minister is very keen on, also owns a company that he's not publicly talking about that is trying to run the pilot for Britain and central bank digital currencies. Those are the most immediate things that I think we need to be aware of, because if all of our currency is on a central bank digital currency, we can very quickly get to the point of what Josh was talking Mm -hmm. about with prisons, Mm -hmm. like practically overnight. And the thing with that is I, I don't think that you can quickly create that system either. I think a lot of these central banks that are talking about this and writing pilots, I think are inherently ignorant into how fledgling the technology still is to actually be able to do what they're talking about. I think it's just not possible. I, I work with the technology every day. I don't think you could do it at that scale um, securely and what they're talking about. Um, but regardless, those are the most immediate burning things that are happening. And then from there, I would say is like have these type of conversations and have these type of conversations of ethics of technology and I think we can get, we'll end up getting there. Um, I think most of the big problem that we have right now, at least insofar as I care, I'd love to hear what you guys think about this too as, as we close, but is the fact that it's hard to see the noise and hard to find the signal. And I think we just need to be talking more about these things because right now the noise is just, it's just going to keep pushing you forward into wherever it is that the zeitgeist is taking you, whatever the mob is going and wherever it goes um, and however kind of the collective... <laughs> noise and outrage yeah. that we have is going to get steered next. Um, but if we have small conversations like this, where we seemingly talk about these things and we walk through our lives, understanding what the implications of it is, I think that's when you get that type of revolution that is silent because revolutions are silent. You know, if mm-hmm. it's something like the French revolution where it's incredibly violent and terrible, that's actually not a revolution that you want. That's, that's like, that's blood. You don't want blood. You want something mm-hmm. silent and takes time because that's sustainable. And then it's actually virtuous in my opinion. Yeah. That was brilliantly, brilliantly phrased. Um, my my add on, seriously, I think you know that's that's a great uh, summary. And uh, my, my my add on to that is, I'm a big advocate for decentralization. So I'd say if there's anything you can do on an individual level, it's learn about why decentralization matters. Learn about how we can have fair voting systems in these de- decentralized systems, and if you can, support it financially like you know invest in these if if possible if you if you have the means to to just sort of push this forward be active on twitter and just sort of educating people around it like with with what i'm doing with my various businesses is trying to create decentralized systems for things like property ownership and management and um doing so we're actually doing something around fitness as well but um obviously i'm not going to get into that but it's to do, do as much as you can personally to push for decentralization because the alternative is the central bank digital currency and complete control so yeah Nice. And one last thing to that too is decentralized also can mean shopping local, shopping in community. Yeah. You, we used to keep money in our communities mm. because we would buy from people in our communities. And you know, if it's like Soapy Oaks, there's this guy in Texas who makes a bunch of soap products that I really love. Um, and it's like all organic. And it's it, that even though it's coming from Texas to where I live in Indiana, it's decentralized because there's no intermediary. There's no L'Oreal. There's no you know big giant corporation at the top. So decentralized means less links in the chain be more connected with everything that you have and, you know, what is actually powering you. If it's the scalp cream I use or uh, the food I Hmm. eat or whatever it may be. Those are some awesome practical takeaways. So yeah, thanks guys. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate your time. Thank you. This was, I feel like part of this was Yusuf running the show, which thank you for that, by the way. Uh, (laughs) You were the guiding spirit. (laughs) Yeah. You were the guiding (laughs) spirit that kind of guided us through. Um, I, I felt like we went on a real journey here. We we had a start point, we've we've had an end point, and we've had a great sort of middling winding road going through everything. So oh, if you've it, been listening, well, I I'm, hope I'm, you've managed to follow along and it's kind of not been too all over yeah. the place. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah. I, and if, if if you're anything like like me, you've you've gone from totally ignorant about this to like, fuck, we should really be paying some attention to this stuff. This isn't just a tech upgrade, this is a potential societal rug pull mm-hmm. paradigm shift for sure mm-hmm. well we can stop it there thank you all i really appreciate your time <laughs>